Good morning, everybody. We are glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. If you're in the hallways, you can make your way in here. We uh, have a lot of things to think about before we start our service in our announcement slot. Uh, the first thing, we do want to invite you back to our service this evening at 6 o'clock tonight. We have an opportunity to gather back together. Uh, we are in the process of working our way through the book of Matthew. Uh, we have gotten to uh, the scene where we see Jesus is going to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane this evening. And it uh, will be a challenging time as we think about the sacrifice that Christ has made for us uh, through the trials and through the cross. So uh, we won't get that far this evening, but we'll at least get through the arrest and maybe a trial. Um, so we invite you back uh, tonight. Uh, if you are regularly attending here, you know we have a caring center in the back of our hallway right when you leave our auditorium. Uh, there are a couple cards back there. We do encourage you to make your way to that after our service and, and sign those cards and be an encouragement uh, to a couple different folk that need our encouragement this week. Well, our week is normal. We have uh, Luana and youth group and all those kinds of things on Wednesday evening. And so we invite you to that as well. There's a couple of announcements that I want to make that are not in your bulletin. Uh, the first is for those that are retired or at least have Thursday, October 28th off. On Thursday, October 28th, uh, J.R. George and Glenn Perry are leading a group to the Holocaust Museum in Farmington Hills. Uh, I used to live in Farmington Hills, actually. Um, but uh, So that's over uh, Detroitish area. And uh, so on October 28th, it uh, looks like you're going to be going to Cracker Barrel on the way back. And uh, to get in the museum costs 8 bucks. Um, and if you're over 62, you get to save a couple bucks. So that's uh, 6 bucks. So I guess with age comes cheapness. I don't know. I guess don't quote me out of the context here, okay? Um, I cannot be judged on how I give the announcements, but I can. Um, anyway, so that's taking place on the 28th, so we just wanted to make you aware of that. And uh, ladies, uh, perk your ears for this next announcement. There's going to be a ladies Bible study starting on um, October 21st, so... Uh, a couple weeks away on Elijah. I've watched through several of the videos in this Bible study. Uh, I think it'll be a very challenging and a, and a good, uh, good study for you. Um, uh, there is a promo that I'd like to show you right now. Hey there, I'm Priscilla, and I'm inviting you to join me for a seven session Bible study on the life of Elijah. is the premier prophet of the Old Testament and his life and his journey with God teaches us so much about what it looks like to be bold, to be fearless, to have character in the midst of a culture that is increasingly anti-truth and anti-God. Because we operate by the power and the presence and the discernment of the Spirit of God, we should still be able to live in alignment with the promises that our God has declared to us. So just like Elijah, if God said it, then let's proclaim it. So if you want to live the kind of life, like I do, that invites the fire of God's presence upon our lives, then I invite you to join me as we study Elijah. Like I said, that study will begin on October 21st. There is a sign up. If you leave the auditorium and turn to your right on this wall, there is a sign up for that Bible study, ladies, if you are interested in taking part in that. I think that's uh, the announcements that I need to highlight at this point. Um, let's open our service in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we come into your presence, and we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here today. And Lord, I do pray that uh, as we try to focus our mind and focus our thoughts on you today, that we would understand that we serve a great God, a God that's in control, a God that is sovereign, a God that loves. And Lord, as 
We want to focus on those things as we sing, and we want to focus on those things as we look into your word today. Lord, I do pray that you'll be honored and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to take your copy of God's word this morning and turn and find the book of Revelation, chapter 1. As we start thinking about our worship today, our first song this morning is going to be called Behold Our God. And we're going to sing about God sitting on his throne. And I couldn't think of a better passage to look at uh, than John, the disciple. And God allowed him to see that throne room in Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse number 10. If you would, would you stand with me as we read God's word this morning, and then we'll be prepared to sing. In verse 10, it says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, his eyes like the flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze, and when it has been made glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And I placed in his right hand me saying, and he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death and Hades. That's our God. Let's worship him in song right now. in his hands who has known but every grain of sin kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold our God seated his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us to the Lord who can question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold our God seated on his throne Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Bearing all the guilt of sinful men, God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, 
on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. You will reign forever.
Out of the depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways? How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. So put your hope in God alone. Take courage in his power to save. Completely and forevermore, by Christ emerging from the grave, I will wait for you, I will wait for you on your word. I will rely, I will wait for you, surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. Now he has come to make a way, and God himself has paid the price. That all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice. I will wait for you, I will wait for you on your word. I will rely, I will wait for you, surely wait for you, till my soul is satisfied. I will wait for you, I will wait for you, through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my delight. You may be seated. I don't know if you noticed the progression of our songs this morning, but we started looking into the throne room of God, and then the next couple looked at life here. Now, with, with that progression in mind, as we look into our text today, and I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and find Acts chapter 16 within it, but as we look into our text today, I am convinced in order to live out life well here, we have to have an accurate view of of our God. We have to have an accurate view of the throne room of God, that he is sovereign, that he sits on the throne, and there's nothing that's going to take place here that's going to affect the throne room of God and scare the throne room of God. And there's nothing that's going to take place here that's going to catch God by surprise. And in fact, in his sovereignty, in the way that he works, he works in such a way that what takes place in our life, those trials that we just sang about, the fact that we have to wait for him, no matter what takes place in our life here, it's in control in the throne room of God. And we're going to see that in our text today. Uh, some of you that know me are very much aware that I am a baseball fan. I like baseball. I like playing baseball as a child. When I got a little older and a little slower, it turned into softball. And when I got a little older and a little slower, it turned into sitting on the couch and watching other people do it. 
Right now we're in the midst of the Major League uh, playoffs right now and, and watching men in their prime playing this game we call baseball. And in a game called baseball, it's not uncommon that those guys in black, that wear the black shirts, occasionally get upset with the people that are playing the game and our coaches that are coaching the game. And occasionally they take this little thumb and they look somebody square in the eyes and they say, you're out of here. Well, that's not always a good thing. That means they have to leave the dugout. It means they have to leave the field. It means they have to leave the game. The umpire has the right to do that. But in a game in September, umpire and crew chief Terry Timmons was accused of ejecting not a ball player, not even a coach. And occasionally they'll eject a fan, not even a fan. He was accused of ejecting the ground crew. Now, for those of you that are not into baseball as much as some, the ground crew are simply the people that take care of the grounds. Not a tough concept. And when rain tends to come in in the middle of a game, the ground crew are the ones that are responsible for taking a big old tarp that's sitting usually off to the side by one of the dugouts and unrolling that tarp and putting it over the infield so too much water doesn't get on the infield to stop uh, the game from resuming after the rain comes. Well, on this September evening, the rain started to come. It was the ninth inning. It was the middle of the ninth inning. And as the rain started to come, uh, Mr. Timmons noticed that the ground crew took their rightful positions next to the tarp, ready for a game delay, ready for a rain delay, and they were about to put the tarp on the field as the rain started cascading down from the clouds. When Mr. Timmons saw this, he looked at the grounds crew and said, well, one might suspect why people think that he ejected the grounds crew. But after the game, he writes this, I didn't eject the grounds crew. I just didn't want them by the tarp. We wanted to finish the game, and uh, I, for their safety, I didn't want them on the infield waiting to put the tarp on, so I asked them to move. He wanted to continue the game. He made a judgment call, and that's what umpires do all the time. They make judgment calls. Sometimes we agree with their judgment calls. Sometimes we disagree with those judgment calls. Uh, different sport. Football, there was a few calls yesterday I didn't necessarily agree with uh, in some of the games, and well, the one game in particular that I care about that I watched. But, you know, umpires and referees have the right to make those judgment calls. Well, the, it was the right judgment. Now, moments later, the Yankee ball player, Brett Gardner, hit a two-run signal that ended the game. They got the game in. Rather than a long delay, rather than sending the teams back to the locker room and bringing them back out, Mr. Timmons made a judgment call based on the information that he had, trying to do what's best for Major League Baseball, trying to do what's best for the players, trying to do what's best for the fans, and I'm guessing there's a little bit of selfishness, trying to get back to his hotel room and have dinner. He made that call. Now, why do I start with baseball this morning? When we serve the Lord, there's a lot of things that run through our minds, and there are times in our service to God that we have to make a judgment call. We have to look at the circumstances around us, and we have to make a decision based on the circumstances around us and based on what we know what's in this book and what we know about our God. And what we know about our God that's in control of the circumstances around us. It's applying God's plan to whatever circumstance we might see around us. And that's exactly where we are in Acts chapter 16. It's exactly what we've already seen and we will continue to see as we walk through this chapter with a missionary by the name of Paul and another missionary by the name of Silas. Uh, just to kind of get us caught up and where we are in this text, I ask you to turn to Acts 16. Look with me at verse number 12. And from there, 
to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, we were staying in the city for some days. You see, we're in the midst of the second missionary journey. We're in the midst of God directing the steps of Paul and Silas, and uh, they're the people that were working with them. And God had already led them across Asia. And he said, led them across Asia, he commanded them not to speak. He brought them to the coast, and then he led them across the Aegean Sea. And then finally he led them, and according to verse number 12, he led them to a place called Philippi. And they stayed there. And at Philippi, if you were with us last week, they met a couple different ladies there. The first person that they met in Philippi was a lady by the name of Lydia. Look at verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside. It was supposed to be a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her households, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come stay at my house. And she prevailed upon us. They met Lydia down by the place of prayer, down by the river where these ladies had gathered. There wasn't even enough Uh, believers in Yahweh, Jews in this city, to even uh, have a synagogue. So they were down by the place of prayer. God directed Paul and Silas and the crew down there, and they met Lydia, and she trusted in Jesus Christ, and those with her trusted in Jesus Christ, and she was baptized, and then she invites them into her house. I preached a sermon last Sunday, as you know, and I got home last Sunday uh, sitting around my table, uh, we now have a college-age small group that, are, are, that runs, and they're going through a, a, a curriculum and looking at the, the book of Philippians together. And in that, the, their DVD, Matt Chandler is the, the speaker on that, he called her and the, 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 the conversation around my table when they got to Lydia, and I wish I'd have had this information last week, he called her a fashionista. Isn't that a great description? I mean, she was uh, able to take this material. She built a big business, and, and she was an influencer, and now she and her family have trusted in Jesus Christ. Then I met a second lady in Philippi. We see her in verse number 16, and they were going to the place of prayer, and we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. So she followed Paul and us out crying out these men are servants of the most high god who proclaim to you the way of salvation so the next woman was not a god seeker like lydia and the ladies down by the river this next woman was controlled by a demon in fact we're not even given her name and this woman was following around paul and silas and they everywhere they went this woman was crying out these men are servants of the most high god who proclaim the way of the lord And the original text has the idea that this happened over and over and over again in the tents. And then even here it says, after many days, uh, Paul gets finally fed up with this and cast that demon out, verse 18. He was greatly annoyed and turned to the Spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. You see, Paul and and Silas, they were walking, they were following the plan God had for them. It brought them into the city of Philippi, and now they're doing their best to follow what God's plan is for them. And God's plan was for them to meet this group of ladies and to see salvation take place. God's plan was for them to meet this demon-possessed girl and give her freedom from that demon. That's where we left the story last week. And now it's my job to pick up this story and see how it concludes. It's far from over. You see, God in his sovereignty, God sitting in his throne room, had another family that he was seeking out in this town. And this family was a jailer and those that belonged to his household. And now he needs to get Paul and Silas to meet the jailer. And it starts with the crowd. Verse 19, the people of Philippi. 
But when her owners saw that there was hope, their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought him to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they're disturbing our city. And they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they inflicted many blows on them, they threw them in prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Well, this journey turns pretty quick on Paul and Silas. One moment they're down by the river seeing salvation, people trusting in Jesus Christ. The next moment they're seeing the power of God in exercising that demon. And now, within a heartbeat, they're being arrested, they're being beaten, and they're being thrown in jail. But they still need to figure out God's plan in the circumstances. They still need, in the words of our song, they still need to wait on God through this to see what He is desiring to do. What Paul did for that servant girl was not appreciated by her owners. In exercising that demon out of that young girl, he also exercised the owner's ability to make money off of that girl. And as you know, when people lose money, people get a little angry. And that's exactly what happened with these guys that owned this girl. They were indifferent to the girl. They could care less about the girl. They wanted the girl to stay in the slavery of that demon just so that they could make money off of her state. They stir up the city. Paul and Silas are dragged to the marketplace and pulled before the magistrates. The charge against Paul and Silas, they were advocating something we'll call religio illicita. What is that? It's disturbing the peace. It's, it's using religion and customs that are not lawful for Romans and, and pushing that on the Roman society. It's disturbing the Pax Romana the peace between different nationalities under the Roman Empire. They're charged with three different things here, and they're kind of coaxed all in this idea of anti-Semitism. Notice in verse number 20, they're charged with being Jews. Okay, they're charged with being Jews. During this time frame, the emperor Claudius had e ejected all the Jews out of Rome. And that flavor of anti-Semitism had come across in his colonies, and, and now this magistrates, this crowd, looked at Paul and Silas, and they couldn't understand the difference between what they were speaking and what the Jews were trying to teach. So they're accused of, of being Jews. They're accused in verse 21 of advocating customs that are not lawful for Romans to follow. They're also accused of disturbing the city with these customs. So they're pulled before the magistrates. Each Roman colony had two different magistrates, two different leaders that were in charge that governed the city. The charge of the slaves' girls' owners was obviously trumped up. Paul and Silas were innocent of all of these charges. But they stirred up the city and it stirred up the magistrates and it became a big deal. Rome permitted its citizens to exercise what we'll call freedom of religion. But what Rome didn't permit is to take that religion and push it on a Roman citizen. And that's what these men were being accused of. They couldn't distinguish between Judaism and Christianity here. They're just lumped in into Judaism. The crowd is stirred up. The owners of the servant girl stirs up the crowd, which in fact stirs up the magistrates. The city is stirred up, but not by Paul and Silas. Remember the accusation is Paul and Silas stirred up the city. It had nothing to do with that. It was the owners of this slave girl that stirred up the city. It was false charges of the put before Paul and Silas. So before we know it, before we can even blink, 
Paul and Silas are whipped, they're flogged, they're thrown into prison. Now, I don't want to race over this because a lot of times we do race over this. I mean, being flogged was nothing just to take lightly. If you were flogged, you would remember it the rest of your life. You're stripped down to just a loincloth. Your, your arms are, are, are chained and they take whips and they whip the back of your back and the back of your legs and they pull the flesh off of you. This is a, a hard, hard punishment. A punishment that a Roman citizen, by the way, wasn't even allowed to take. That that's exactly what ends up happening. If you've ever been to Sunday school, you know what's going to happen next. They're flogged. They're thrown in jail. Verse number 23. And when they had afflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them in the inner prison, prison, fastening their feet into stocks. They're thrown in jail. No trial. Nothing. Just magistrates, being whipped, being thrown into jail. And then the jail, it says they were put in the inner cell, uh, the most secure place, maybe even a dungeon at this point. And their feet are fastened into stocks. Now, I'm sure we all that grew up uh, in Sunday school see the flannel graph of them smiling and happy, uh, sitting in jail. Uh, You might even see the chains coming off the walls, uh, their feet Uh, fastened there but remember these guys are bloodied they'd been beaten and when they put their feet into stocks it has the idea they did that obviously for more security but it also had the idea of inflicting a little bit more pain as over time the cramps would come this was not a pleasurable situation for paul and silas to be in I mean, this is a terrible, stinky jail cell. They had been beaten for no reason. They were hurting. They were um, just doing what God had told them to do. But, but, they kept the picture of the throne room of God and His sovereignty in their pipes. That was in their mind, and that is going to uh, be the judgment of how they proceed next. They had an incredible amount of discernment and wisdom here. You know, in the words of our opening illustration, they spiritually were ejecting the ground crew. And maybe the ground crew would be uh, those temptations of what to do and those temptations of uh, behaving in, quite frankly, the way most of us might behave in such situations. Maybe we would think, yeah, this is unfair. Maybe we would think, oh, I, being whipped, man, that hurt. God, what are you doing? I'm just doing what you told me to do, and now I'm here. Yeah. Maybe we're thinking about the beating. Maybe we're thinking about the false charges, the fact that they were in jail, the fact that their feet were in stocks. All those things, on a human perspective, were, should have been running around their minds. And one of the most amazing verses in Scripture takes place in verse number 25. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That verse, if I've done my job, should leap off the page. Rather than being focused on the human, rather than being focused on the circumstance, rather than being focused on their personal individual needs, they had a picture of God, they had the discernment to follow God, and in stocks, bloodied and beaten, they were praying and singing hymns to God. We've done both of those things in the last 45 minutes. We have prayed. We have sang hymns to God. They were having a church service in jail. They were leading it. The prisoners, verse 25, were listening to them. Imagine what those guys were thinking. They looked across the jail cell and saw Paul and Silas in worship to their great God. They're singing away. 
They're living out what Paul would later encourage the Philippian church that, by the way, is in the process of being founded at this point. He would encourage them with these words. I guess, sorry, I'm behind saints here. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Even in jail cells. Even when they're innocent of all the charges. Even when they're hurting, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say, rejoice. Leads us to one of our key thoughts this morning. Simply this, praising God is not dependent on circumstances. I'll say that again. Praising God is not dependent on circumstances. Life, the sinful world, will give us all the circumstances and all the excuses that we need not to praise God. But when we get a proper view of the throne room of God and the sovereignty of God, it's not dependent on circumstances. You want to know why it's not dependent on circumstances? Circumstances don't change our God. That's why it's not dependent on circumstances. We can praise God in whatever circumstance we're in because circumstances don't change our God. Our God never changes. That's why... Later on in that little text of Philippians 4, we can read verses like this. I'll start with verse number 4 again. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. That's what Paul and Silas were doing in that prison. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's what they're doing in that prison. Let your request be made known to God. And when that happens, verse 7 in Philippians 4, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Great passage. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence or anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. You can dwell on our God because our God doesn't change. That doesn't take away the pain of the circumstance. I'm sure Paul and Silas were still in a great amount of pain. But it does project the right thought process through the circumstance. It does project the discernment and the wisdom necessary to handle whatever circumstance comes our way. Paul and Silas were exactly where they needed to be. Because that's exactly where God wanted them to be. And because God wanted them there, they knew they had a purpose for being there. And the purpose was not to get introspective. The purpose was not to focus on self. The purpose was not to focus on the circumstance. The purpose was to focus on what does God want me to do in the circumstance? What decision do I need to make within the problem that will allow me to be the light for the reason I'm here And that's exactly what Paul and Silas do as they're singing away and praying away in jail. What's God do? You know the story. God sends an earthquake. In the middle of this church service, God sends an earthquake. The last week we were in the middle of communion and God turned off the lights. Is that two weeks ago? Probably two weeks ago. In the middle of their church service, God sends an earthquake. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Another supernatural deliverance from jail we see in Acts. If you've got a great memory, you can remember when Peter was a frequent visitor to the jails. And Peter supernaturally was let out of the jails in Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 12. This is another supernatural event taking place in the middle of this midnight church service in jail. One can only imagine what this might have been looked like. I mean, I picture in my mind, you know, Paul and Silas all spread out in their stocks. They're singing. I don't know what kind of voices they had, but they sing like me. Maybe the prisoners were saying, well, they want to get some sleep. They're praying. They're, they're 
thanksgiving to God, they're focusing on God in a circumstance, in the middle of their song, in the middle of the prayer, God shakes the place. (laughs) I'm waiting for God to shake our place right now. That would be kind of cool. But God shakes the place. And he, he, in the middle of the shaking, in the middle of the earthquake, all of a sudden, Silas looks down, Paul looks down, I go, oh, wait a minute, I can move my feet now. The stocks are off. They look up and the door is wide open. God, in the middle of this situation. Verse 28. There's an earthquake that's taking place. The jailer is about to kill himself because the prisoners, obviously, at least the jailer's mind, had escaped. And he didn't want to face the punishment from his bosses. Paul cried with a loud voice, verse 28, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Meanwhile, outside of the jail, said jailer has a sword. He's about to fall on that sword. Here's Paul's voice. He comes in with the lights on, turns the lights on with his torches and... um, do not harm yourself. Nobody left. Now, if you're thinking with me this morning, there was probably more, no doubt, there was more people in that jail than just Paul and Silas. And if I just got arrested, I'm not Paul and Silas, I just got arrested and I see my free ticket, I might want to take advantage of that free ticket and get out of jail. But the rest of the inmates in jail were so much in awe of the church service. So much in awe of the attitude of God's servants. So much in awe of the earthquake. I think they were exactly in the same place as a jailer. There was a great fear. They were trembling with fear. What is God going to do next? They didn't move a muscle. Verse 29, again, the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Verse 30, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Every human being that walks the face of this planet on this day better think about this question. It is a question that we all must wrestle with. What do we do to experience salvation? Some will say, well, you know, if your good outweighs your bad, I experience salvation. Wrong. What must I do to experience salvation? Some say, well, a God of love will save everybody. Wrong. What must I do to be saved? He asked the exact right question why was he listening to the church service that got interrupted by the earthquake possibly did he know what the servant girl when the demon was in her was saying these men are servants of the most high god did he hear that charge maybe did the earthquake shake him so much with fear that he had a new respect for who the god was behind the earthquake Maybe. Who knows what brought him to this other than the fact that the Father drew him. And the same circumstances, by the way, that God used to draw this one to himself could have been the same circumstances that his own servants could have pulled away from God in. Ever thought about that? The beatings, the arrest, the fact that they were in jail could have taken Paul and Silas and drew them, separated them uh, in a relational way, away from God because they had the wrong attitude in them. They didn't. They had the right attitude. But those exact same circumstances God used to bring this jailer, this pagan, to himself. So basically what I'm saying here is when you look at circumstances, we got to look at them through the window of the throne room of God. And let God be God, and we just make the best decisions we can make as his followers, uh, leading on his spirit, understanding his word, 
through the process. Verse 31, the answer to the most important question one can ask. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. The answer to salvation, believe. Trust in Christ. Verse 31 is a key passage in the message of faith. All that's needed for one to be declared right before God is a belief in Jesus Christ. The fact that His forgiveness was granted to you at His cross. The fact that He paid your sin. Belief. It's all that's required. Who believes on Him is not judged, but he who does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus told Nicodemus. Romans 10.9 If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. 1 Corinthians 1.21 For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, but God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. 1 John 5.13 These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And the list could go on and on and on. I just want to take one moment and stop and take a breath in this story that we're looking at, in this historical event that we're studying, and ask you if you've ever asked the most important question ever of your God. What must I do to be saved? Has that question been answered for you? Have you believed, have you trusted in the work of Jesus Christ? If you haven't trusted in Christ, please do yourself a huge favor. Tap me on the shoulder when you leave. Allow me 15 minutes to sit down with God's Word and show you what belief is and show you how you can be saved. Maybe for most of us in this room, this is something that we look back on with great joy. A day that we trusted in Jesus Christ. Back to our text, verse 31. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved in your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him on all that were in his house. It wasn't just this jailer who trusts in Jesus Christ. It's those that are in his house, just like in this... A little bit earlier with Lydia, now here with the jailer. That belief started and the domino effect of those that were in their house. They trusted in Jesus Christ. And that very night, verse 33, he took them the same hour that night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Now picture this. He trusts in Christ. Salvation has come to his house. Bloodied and beaten, Paul and Silas step into that water. And they were able to baptize this family as identifying them with their belief in Jesus Christ. The jailer, then take Paul and Silas, they wash them up, bandage their wounds, feed them dinner, and now we get the rest of the story. But it starts with the belief. They believed in God. How's this rest of the story play out? Verse 35, And when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go, therefore come out now and go in peace. For whatever reason, Paul and Silas' stay was one night. Maybe it was always going to be one night. Maybe they were going to beat him, throw him in jail, and let him go in the next morning. Maybe the earthquake had kind of uh, scared the, the magistrates uh, as well, but now they want to be done with Paul and Silas. They want to let him go. Verse 37, though. And Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and now they want to throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. 
And they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. And they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. The next morning, they send for Paul and Silas. They just want to release them and let them go. Paul says, no. We're not leaving that quickly. In fact, you guys blew it. You beat us. I'm a Roman citizen. Roman citizens were not allowed to be flogged. Roman citizens were not allowed to be thrown in jail without a trial. You blew it. Let me raise the question. I was studying through this. Why did Paul wait to this point to announce his citizenship? Seems to me there's a whip coming at any of our backs, that might be a good time, right? If you could stop a whipping by simply saying, oh, excuse me, let me show you my license here. You're not allowed to do this. I'm, I'm a Roman. But no, Paul and Silas decided to keep their mouths shut while they were whipped. Why? They decided to spend the night in jail. Why? Why wait till the next morning after the punishment when they're free to go to say, uh, we're not leaving, we're Roman citizens? Dare I say they looked at this situation again through the window of the throne room of God and God in His Spirit had given them wisdom and discernment that this was the right time to play that card that you've been holding in your hand that you know will give you the victory in the game. This was the right time to play that card. Don't play that card too soon. What happens if, in the middle of the whipping, in the middle of the flogging, Paul says, here's my citizenship papers. Where are we with the jailer? Where are we with the jailer's family? Where are we with the church in Philippi that is being founded at this very moment? No, they had the wisdom and the sermon to hold off till now. Well, why did they hold off till now? Why is this the proper time to play the card? Why is this the top proper time to make this statement? Because there was a group of ladies down by the river that trusted in Jesus Christ. And there was a now a jailer in his household that trusted in Jesus Christ. They were about to leave this area. And now was the right time to say, oh, by the way, you owe us something because you should have never done this. Now is the right time to say, publicly bring us out, publicly walk us out, publicly apologize to us. Verse 39, again, should leap off the page. They came and apologized to them. Does the government ever apologize for anything? They came and apologized to them. They were scared of the repercussions of all this, and that gave a beautiful sense of peace to the Christians that were left in Philippi, that that church could now start and grow. Why? Because these two servants of God were able to live in wisdom and discernment and understand how God was working through it all. How do we want to leave here? What's our acts for the day? Taking the last two weeks and kind of putting them together. What can we learn from the ladies in Philippi? God knew Lydia needed someone, needed to know more about him. And he directed the events of both her life and this missionary team to meet with Lydia down by the river that Sabbath day. For the servant girl... God knew this girl needed to be freed from the control of her sin. And he directed events in her life to be freed. We don't know what happened to her after that, so we can't make any conclusions. From the jailer, God used a bad situation to create a life-changing outcome. Changed the life of this jailer's family. You know, it's interesting to me, Lydia was seeking God, and God showed up. God was seeking the jailer. But both cases, belief was had. 
for our lives. God desires to use every circumstance, good and bad, to draw us closer to Him. We need to navigate our lives with the understanding that God is always at work. He's always working in the circumstances. Uh, He's always working to bring about His will. We just need to be obedient. We just need to have discernment. We need to have wisdom. We need to look at God rather than the circumstances. And then we can, like Paul, like Silas, we can live in a way that will blow people's minds as we rely on the Holy Spirit to navigate this life that He has for us. I want to end with a rather familiar person. I'm sure most of you uh, have heard of Bethany Hamilton. You know her story. Maybe you've watched the movie made about her. She was a surfing talent at a young age, at 14, or at a young age, a 14 foot tiger shot came and was attacked while she was out surfing. She lost her arm, and through a midst of several years of a comeback, um, she's also a believer in Jesus Christ. She gets back to surfing, but that's not what draws me to Bethany Hamilton. What draws me to her is a statement that she made in one of her documentaries. She said this, God did have something bigger planned for me. All I needed to do was trust and believe. God has something bigger planned for each of us. All we need to do is trust and believe and rely on Him. And in that context, let me leave you with one more passage of Scripture. See, the Apostle Paul echoed the words of Bethany way before Bethany said them herself. In Romans 8, you know where I'm going. Starting in verse 28. For we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your time, or our time in your word today. And Lord, I'm sure there's so much more to this text. But Lord, I pray that we would allow your spirit to take your word and challenge each of us today. Lord, you're a great God. Sometimes the circumstances in life are not great, but we can always have confidence that your greatness can work in whatever circumstances. We can always worship you because we know that you never change. And Lord, help us live our lives this week with those truths. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing a final song together.
pray together. Father, we do thank you that your grace has poured out. Lord Jesus, thank you for the ability to have the chain of sin being broken, and we can live in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We are glad that you worshiped with us this morning. Um, if you're joining us online, right about here on your screen, you'll see a uh, our website, and if you would like to uh, worship in your giving that way, you can click on that link. Uh, for those of us that are in the auditorium, if you want to continue your worship as you leave, we have offering boxes in the back, a um, couple different places, and out on a worship center. We thank you all for being here. If you are worshiping with us for the very first time, there's a card and a chair in front of you. You can fill that out. We'd love to have you fill that out so we know who you are and uh, take that to our information table out by the doors, and we'd like to send you home with a gift uh, for being here today. Uh, we do have those cards right across the hallway. If you haven't had opportunity to sign a card to be an encouragement to somebody, make sure you stop there as well. And just as another note of information before we go, um, starting on Friday this week, I am on vacation for the next couple uh, so next Sunday, we'll have the opportunity to have Doug Hinkin bring our word. He's one of our elders. And then the Sunday after that, we have another one of our elders, Jeremy Wise, that will be bringing God's word to us. If there is an emergency and you need to get a hold of me, you can always call me on my cell phone, or you can, uh, if it's something that's local, that can be handled locally here. I will be out of town, but uh, or we have all of our elders, and uh, hopefully you know who those guys are by now, uh, that you can contact as well. With that said, let's stand and we'll dismiss with prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity again that we have to be here. We thank you for the service. But Lord, as we go, I pray that our minds can stay engaged. I pray that our hearts will still uh, listen to your spirit as we consider what you want to do with our hearts as a result of being here today. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>